Welcome to the McMillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Dean Carlin, a professor of economics at Yale University. Professor Carlin has been called one of the most creative and prolific young economists in the world. His research lies at the intersection of two of the hottest areas in the field, behavioral economics and development microfinance. With 3.4 million in funding he just received from City Foundation, Professor Carlin and the organization he founded, Innovations for Poverty Action, will conduct research on strategies to improve the financial capability of low and moderate income individuals across the world. This funding builds on a $7.3 million grant he received from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to study innovations in savings products and payment channels for poor households worldwide. Professor Carlin also has a new book out that he wrote with Jacob Appel entitled More Than Good Intentions, Improving the Ways the World's Poor Borrow, Save, Learn, and Stay Healthy. Today we talk with him about ways to end global poverty. Welcome, Professor Carlin. Thanks. Thanks for having me. This is your second visit here with us, and mm -hmm. so much has happened in the past year, the, the past five years since you've been on. You've um, received quite a bit of uh, research money, um, and you have that at your disposal to do some work. So let's begin uh, by talking about the two grants you received and what you're doing with the money. Sure. Um, well, actually, I don't use most of the money. Oh, um, okay. the, the, I think the most exciting thing is that we are seeing a lot of other researchers interested in these topics about mm -hmm. how to use uh, behavioral economics in particular, but the, the topics go wider than just behavioral economics, but how to use uh, economic analysis and experiments in, in particular to test out different ideas about how people manage their cash, how mm -hmm. they manage finances, how they make decisions to borrow and save and how to design better products that will help people achieve their goals better. Mm -hmm. And so with both of, the, both of these grants, we have a, actually a pot of money that we open up competitively to researchers around the world to propose ideas. And some of it has already been doled out through mm -hmm. the Gates Foundation and the City Foundation grant we're now getting started as well um, to, to allocate it to good proposals that come forward. And so well, yeah, some of it does actually go to also fund some of the research that, that, that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, but the majority of it is actually to, to give out to other researchers interested in these topics. OK, I do want to come back to that and ask you, what are some of those specific things that have, um, that have um, produced? Um, but before we do that, I, I want to um, uh, throw a quote out here that I found mm -hmm. in your book. It says, in your book, um, you write that we've thrown billions down a sinkhole over the past 50 right. years and accomplished almost nothing. In America alone, individual donors contribute over 200 billion to charity annually, and that's three times as much as corporations, foundations, and bequests combined. I, of course, was shocked to read that, and I'm wondering why has that m money not made a mm -hmm. difference, and, and what what are we doing wrong, basically? So the context in which I mean that is, I wouldn't say that the money has not made a difference. The problem mm -hmm. is that we don't know if it's made a difference. And okay. so we don't learn from what we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. And that's the sense in which it's been thrown down a sinkhole. With just a tiny sliver of that had gone to understanding what's really working and what's not, mm -hmm. then we can allocate each, each year, it can grow and grow in terms of how much of our, don how much of the donations are able to go towards things that have really strong evidence behind it. Right? And so it's always going to be a, you know, uh, a spectrum, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's not to say that every single dollar should only go towards things which have strong evidence behind them. We, sure. need, we need to fund innovation, we need to fund experimentation and, um, and creative ideas. Uh, that are too early to have strong evidence behind them, and we need to fund that type of work too. So there's a, there's a fair amount of things that go into that space, but the problem over the years has been that we just um, we see things get funded for political reasons mm -hmm. and because they sound good, basically, when we look at the individual donor money, who, who made the best appeal through marketing approaches. Okay. And that's a shame. And so the way we can do much better is both by educating donors about, about what types of ideas have strong evidence behind them and what do not. Educating donors about which types of organizations are learning organizations or organizations which really commit themselves to testing their core principles and finding out does what I do work and mm -hmm. if not how do, can we shift into something that works better. 
I much prefer to support an organization with my, if I'm going to support my, with my own money, an organization that has done things that didn't actually prove to work, but they documented it and they showed this didn't work and they moved on. Right. That's huge. Mm -hmm. The leverage from that for the world to learn from that is much bigger. And so I personally would prefer to support organizations, even if everything doesn't come out roses, mm -hmm. as long as they're carefully documented, to an organization that does something which sounds good, but doesn't have strong evidence behind it. Sure. Let's talk about some of those researchers that you did give funding to. Um, what are some of the projects um, that are going on out in the world, and, and what are you finding? So one of the, the um, well, a lot of the, the results are not in from any of the stuff we funded. Uh -huh. It's been too recent that okay. we allocated the money to the, to, the, to the actual projects. Our first allocation of money was six months ago, I believe. Okay. Um, so what I can speak to is broadly the, some of the research that went into how we chose which projects to fund okay, and what we learned from that. So, for instance, in the space of microfinance, you, for the longest time, microfinance has been defined almost synonymously as microcredit. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, there's two problems with that. One is that microfinance, the word finance, means a lot more than credit. It also means savings, and it means insurance. Mm -hmm. and, um, and one could also often include things like financial education into, into this kind of large rubric. Um, but yet the emphasis of a lot of the organizations over the years has been on the credit side. And one of the things that has happened is in the, in the rigorous evaluations, the randomized trials that have been done on microcredit, it's not the case that the, the promise of microcredit um, has come true, right? The promise being to like lift millions of people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. It is the case that some important positive benefits uh, were found. So on average, things were looking good. It was looking like a good program, but not one that uh, lives up to its, its, its promises that had been made for years. Mm -hmm. and, and furthermore, it was also clear that it wasn't so, um, that the donor money wasn't so clear that it was needed. The, the for-profits were coming in and having this, doing the same thing as the nonprofits. Why okay. do you need, you know, so that the nonprofits served their role 30 years ago in kind of that innovation phase, figuring out how to do this. And this is actually a good model in general for the world. Like, subsidize the innovation phase, see that something can be done, but then find out that it actually is sustainable to do as a for-profit enterprise. Let the investor money come in and then take it to scale. Mm -hmm. um, now, so the, so the first problem in that big phase was the lack of attention to the savings and to insurance. And those are now in that similar spot that I think credit was 20 or 30 years ago okay. in the sense that we're now innovating, figuring out how to do this, seeing that there can be really big benefits from savings and insurance. Mm -hmm. That a lot of times that people were borrowing, they were borrowing because they didn't have a good savings option or a good insurance option. And that's actually what they would prefer, and that's actually the f better fit for what their, their needs were. Mm -hmm. um, and we are seeing, in the rigorous evidence, much bigger impacts from the savings and insurance interventions than we do from the credit interventions. Okay. Um, the second big problem with the term microcredit is the way it's so easy to flip it around and make it sound bad by just calling it micro debt. Okay. And it's one of, the, one of those simple cases where language tells us a lot about the viewpoints that someone has. When I get a phone call from a journalist who asks me questions about micro debt, I immediately know that this is a journalist who is trying to write a story that comes out badly for micro credit because mm -hmm. they're calling it debt. Right. We owe debt, we're uh -huh. burdened with debt, yes. but we earn credit. Right, very simple point, mm -hmm. but it, you really tell a lot when sure. the language people use. And um, the problem is that the critics of micro credit, the ones who call it micro debt, uh, had just as bad evidence as the proponents. Okay. Just simple before after stories of people who had loans and then bad things happened to them. And it's the same thing as the, the proponents of micro credit who pointed to people who had loans and good things happened to them. We don't know what would have happened had either of them not gotten access to loans. Right. And this is what the randomized trials have done for us, has helped us understand what would have happened had people not gotten access to loans. Did things get better or things mm -hmm. get worse? And we're using that same approach when we do our evaluations of savings and insurance, mm -hmm. where we are finding much systematically much bigger impacts. What parts of the world are you working in? Um, so personally, I, don't, I, don't, I have some areas where I do more work mm -hmm. than others, but we're very much more idea-focused than region-focused in the way we okay. tackle problems. So I do a lot of work in Ghana, uh, Uganda, the Philippines. Uh, I used to do a lot of work in Peru, but mm -hmm. less so now. Um, so we're, we're fairly spread out. Um, organizationally, Innovations for Poverty Action is spread out in 45 countries mm -hmm. with big presence in 14 countries. And I use, you know, I, IPA, Innovations for Poverty Action, I refer to as IPA, is 
um, the, the field arm that coordinates all of the research mm -hmm. that I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking for um, a, a success story, if you will. I mean, mm -hmm. can you cite any particular, particular project that you know of that is succeeding? And why so, it's succeeding? So within the space of microfinance, the, there's three that we, we often will point to. Two that are on the savings side and mm -hmm. one on insurance. Okay. So one that I'm particularly excited about is uh, work that I've done with Chris Udry here at Yale mm -hmm. um, and Robert Osai and Isaac Osai at the University of Ghana. And here we set up a study in, in northern Ghana where there was a lot of underinvestment in agriculture, specifically fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Very, uh, would seem to be clear evidence that there is returns to be had from investing more money in fertilizer, but yet we see fertilizer use lower than we think it should be from the agronomy um, studies that are done. And so we wanted to find out why aren't, why aren't people investing? And there are two leading hypotheses. Uh, because everybody knows about fertilizer. So, mm -hmm. you know, one hypothesis that could be put forward is they don't know about the returns. But it seems like if you ask people, do you know that fertilizer can make you more money, most people say yes. So that didn't seem to be, from a diagnostic process, mm -hmm. what the issue was. The things people talk about is, I don't have the money. Uh -huh. And the other thing they talk about is, I don't want to put money into it. It's too risky. Right? I, I'm afraid that if I take all my money and put it into my farm and then there's not that good rain, mm -hmm. I lose everything. Right. So I need to. I don't. I don't want to put it in because I'm. I'm afraid of the risk. So we tested out both of those stories simultaneously by taking some farmers, um, and then randomly assigning them to one of four groups. One group we gave them money. We didn't give them a loan. We didn't want to see whether they were willing to take out the loan. There's a lot of issues that then you'd have to ask about why they're willing or not willing. We just wanted to give them money to find out whether if we relaxed the I don't have money explanation, by giving them money, would they then put money in the, in the farm? Right. We had another group where we gave them free rainfall insurance. And the idea here is let's take away that risk. So we just tell them, look, if rainfall is really bad, we're going to give you money. We don't give them any money up front, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no extra relaxation of their, of their problem of I don't have money. Mm -hmm. right? All we do is we say to them, if there's bad rainfall, we'll cover your losses. There was a third group that got both. Because maybe, even if they have money, they're not willing to put it in mm -hmm. because of the risk. So let's do a third group where we both give the money and the rainfall insurance. Mm -hmm. And then a fourth group that got nothing. That's the control group. And we did this over three years. Different, the experiment got a little more complicated in the second and third year. But um, the basic result was really striking, that the insurance was really what was driving things. So even in the rainfall insurance only group, we gave them no money. Investment in the farm went up, more fertilizer use, more hiring of labor to work the farm, and more acres cultivated. Mm -hmm. Now, if we gave them money, too, we also did see some investments, but not as many. But it's really striking to us how much more investment took place after just removing the risk and not giving money. Right. It says that, you know, it's not to say that they weren't liquidity constrained and didn't, and, and didn't have to struggle to come up with the money, mm -hmm. but it does say when you took away the risk, they figured out how to come up with money to invest more in the farm. Sure. And that's a very striking story that tells us that we need to figure out better how to mitigate risk right. for the poor um, because it is holding back growth because investment leads to growth and leads to all sorts of other good things. Mm -hmm. And if risk is the underlying problem, that's something we need to tackle better. Sure. So the question of the day, <laughs> do you think global poverty can ever be ended? No. No? No. That's too, you know, that's the type of rhetoric that you hear a lot. Um, I always cringe when I'm, I've had many situations where I'm giving talks mm -hmm. and someone proposes the title of Solving Global Poverty. Um, this book that I just wrote, um, or released recently, you know, that was initially in the, in the subtitle and we had to kind of negotiate that out. Mm -hmm. um, look, these things can make big differences. Mm -hmm. And it's really striking sometimes how big a difference one can make right. with, a, with a small interventions. But ending global poverty is, is setting yourself up for failure. Right. Right? That's just a little bit too ambitious. I mean, look at America. We have poverty here, too. Right. Right? Even if our best of dreams is to get some of the countries that we're working in to look like uh, America when it comes to economic well-being, mm -hmm. we still have poverty here. Right? So uh, you know, it's not, we're always going to have problems. Right. And the only question is, how can we improve from where we are now? Um, OK, great. What are your plans moving forward? So um, moving forward, there's, I think there's a lot more work that we need to do on how to implement some of these ideas. Mm -hmm. So I'm particularly excited by 
the efforts to scale up some of these solutions, take mm -hmm. rainfall insurance. Mm -hmm. So we have this, this study was on, you know, very carefully done. Now the question is, how do you market this on a larger scale mm -hmm. to get people to buy rainfall insurance? Right. Um, same thing on savings. We've seen really strong evidence from commitment savings accounts and from using text messages to remind people to save from, um, from three different studies with just, just that, sending people simple text messages. But now there's a whole world of questions about how to actually implement this on a larger scale, uh, to do it in a cost-effective way. And I think that's a lot of the, the tension we see is that a lot of the studies are about ideas. Mm -hmm. And so we learned that an idea works. But then the next question we have to ask is, how do you implement this right. on a large scale? And how do you get the cost to be down? And we can't forget that. that, that the, 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 the prize at the end of the day is not just validating an idea, but validating an idea that can work right. at large scales. I would imagine communication would be one of the obstacles that needed to be overcome in terms of the implementation of a good idea. Yeah, and that's I mean, two how do you ways. reach all of those people? It's, there's communication in terms of selling things, and there's communication also to organizations. Mm -hmm. So and there's both levels that need to be worked out. So, you know, take, uh, you know, take the rainfall insurance to continue with this example. How do you actually market that? What's the right marketing approach? Mm -hmm. We've seen studies that have financial education given prior to, uh, to farmers that makes a big difference in their willingness to purchase rainfall insurance. Mm -hmm. I've done studies, and so that's really encouraging and it makes sense, but we also see that lots of other things can really affect what people buy that don't, don't fit into our world of what we want to mm -hmm. be influencing things. I did a study on, on credit in South Africa, and it turned out that showing pictures of pretty women to, uh, to potential borrowers was just as effective at getting them to borrow as dropping their interest rate by a third. Wow. Right, so, you know, yeah, sex sells. We know this uh -huh. from lots of marketing. Although that's, why, that's why we see it all the time mm -hmm. in advertising. But that doesn't fit so well with our way of thinking about how to deliver poverty programs. No one ever talks about using sex to sell to sell your services as mm -hmm. an NGO. How did you actually think of to come up with something like that? Um, very simply, we were, we were doing a study that we needed to send out some direct marketing to people to get mm -hmm. them to borrow, um, where we wanted to see how their behavior changed depending on what interest rate they were paying. And we needed a lot of people to come in, so we sat down with the marketing material from the bank and just thought about how one could improve it. Mm -hmm. And we were just brainstorming from different ideas from behavioral economics and psychology and economics uh -huh. about how to make this the best marketing thing ever. And we realized how little we actually knew about which ones of these ideas, which have lots of laboratory evidence behind them, out there in the real world were really going to play out. Mm -hmm. And a lot of marketing people do this for a living, right. but they don't share the data with mm -hmm. us dorky academics all the time. So we don't have that much actual real data about how people respond to these things. And so that was you know, all of a sudden what became really just brainstorming for how to improve the marketing, we realized was actually interesting to test in its own right mm -hmm. and to compare to the interest rate so that we had some relative sense of not just does it matter, but we can actually quantify how much it matters relative to the thing that we economists stick in all our models, which is price. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was um, oh, how that came to be. Interesting. Well, thank you very much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. It's uh, very fascinating. Thanks for having me. Okay. For more information about Professor Carlin and his research, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Mm -hmm.